Ahoy hoy, I'm Planet Walk, and recently I noticed that Mitchell from Australia had posted a video that finally answered the question that everybody's been asking. If the Earth is flat, how come objects disappear bottom first as they go over the horizon? This has been an issue that has been haunting flat earthers for ages, and flat earthers have tried to explain it before, the most notable being Nathan Oakley trying to use the angle of attack to explain it. And every time Flat Earthers do try and explain it, they tend to, you know, get something wrong because they don't really know what they're talking about. So let's see if Mitchell from Australia can do any better. Take it away, Mitchell. I'm Mitchell from Australia, and this is yet another simple observation that anyone can do at home. You have a coin and a flat table. And I'm going to demonstrate how we can make an object disappear bottom up without the need of curvature, or without the need of a physical obstruction for that matter. Now you globers are going to sit at home and say that table is just higher than the observer height or the camera height. Well yes, the surface of that table is higher than the camera and I will be able to show that, but first let's let him explain why he thinks that it's not. Now let's get that sorted quick smart. When we zoom in, we increase the focal length and increase the angular resolution. And we can resolve that coin in its entirety. Uh oh, did he just show that you can zoom up on objects that have disappeared bottom first over the horizon and bring them back into view? This is bad, it might be the end for the globe. Well, either that or there's an explanation for this that I can easily demonstrate, wink wink, nudge nudge. And when you zoom back out, the coin is unresolvable again. Nice flat table, no physical obstruction. This is all optical. So when he lifted his camera, that's going to debunk a point that he made, but we're gonna to get to that later because I want to hear his explanation first. This is due to angular resolution. The angle from the observer to the coin was far too small to resolve the coin. So let me get this straight. The coin is too small to resolve when the camera is right there. Okay, but when you lift the camera up, the coin suddenly becomes large enough for the camera to resolve again. Is that the story you're going to go with, Mitchell? Because when you're lifting the camera up, unless you move the camera a bit closer to the coin, then you're actually increasing the distance to the coin. So the coin should actually be smaller, but for some reason, it's big enough to resolve all of a sudden. Now when I lay it down, we can still see the coin flat on the table. No problem. And you can still see some table underneath the coin. But when you zoom out, the angular resolution is way too small to resolve that coin. Nothing to do with physical obstruction. And the table definitely isn't curving. I'm sorry Mitchell, but physical obstruction is actually one of the factors here. There's another factor, but we're going to get to that. 100% of the light of that coin is still reaching the observer. The only thing that is creating this optical illusion of something disappearing bottom up is the angle to which you are viewing the object. So I'm curious what he means by 100% of the light from the coin is reaching the observer because that is actually a very nebulous phrase that he used there that could mean a lot of things. Now if I'm being really charitable to Mitchell here I could say that it means that none of the light from the coin that reaches the camera is being obstructed by the table. Which is being really charitable, but it also means nothing because obviously light that reaches the camera can't be obstructed by the table. Now the other interpretation, which I think is what Mitchell means, is the table is not preventing any of the light from the coin from getting to the camera. Now if that's what he means, then it is incorrect because the table is actually obstructing some of the light from the coin from reaching the camera. Again, there's two factors at play. One is obstruction from the table and one is another factor. See if you can work out what that other factor is before I reveal it. Now what is angular resolution? Well, it all has to do with the way that we view light, whether it be from your eyeball, a camera, or a telescope. In optics, the best focused spot of light that a perfect lens with a circular aperture can make is called the airy disc. 
Now, as you can see in this left-hand side, there are two points of light and two Aries discs. They are both resolved. Now, when they get closer together, this meets the Rayleigh criterion or the diffraction limit. And so the Rayleigh criterion specifies the minimum separation between two light sources that may be resolved into each distinct object. Now, an important thing to note here is that it talks about the minimum separation between two light sources that can be resolved into distinct objects. However, what we're talking about here is not two separate sources of light. We're talking about a coin that's sitting on a table that's actually touching the table. Now, the reason why this makes a difference is because the distance between the table and the coin is zero. And upon touching the table, the coin just doesn't suddenly become unresolvable. Now, why is this? Well, we can actually think of the coin as a whole lot of different sources of light. Now, some of those sources of light are so close to one another that they are unresolvable. And that's why you don't see all the tiny little details such as scratches on the coin. But most of them are separated enough so that you can make out some of the larger details such as the head of Queen Elizabeth II. Now, the consequence of this is that detail should be lost on an object as it gets further away. And eventually that object should disappear uniformly as it gets too small to resolve. So relating this to my observation, when the coin is closer to the camera, it is fully resolved. As you start moving the coin away from the camera, it meets the Rayleigh criterion or the diffraction limit. And this creates a greater, a smaller angle, making the coin disappear bottom up. And when you move the coin further away, it becomes fully unresolved. The problem here is that Mitchell is treating the coin as though it is one light source with separation from the table, whereas it's actually multiple light sources. Otherwise, there would be no detail on it. Now, as I said, 100% of the light from that coin is still reaching the camera. It's just unresolved. But when you zoom back in, you increase the focal length and you increase the angle at what you are viewing that object. Now when you zoom in enough, it will meet the Rayleigh criterion where you can see the two distinct objects again, the coin and the table. And when you get past that diffraction limit, you can fully resolve the object. Now this has all to do with the angle that you are viewing an object. Okay, that is his explanation. With the image that he just showed, there's a big flaw with the second part. So with the coin in that middle, that looks to be about a quarter obscured. Now, if this was being obscured due to the Rayleigh criterion, then there shouldn't be any detail smaller than what is being obscured. I can clearly make out that the head ends at a certain point, then there is some coin, and then there is the wall behind the coin. If this coin was being obscured due to the Rayleigh criterion, then that small amount of detail, which is smaller than the amount of coin that's being obscured by the table, would be impossible to make out. So that raises the question, what is causing this observation to happen? Well, the first thing is, the table is blocking the light from the coin. The reason why you can bring the coin back into view is because of how focus works on cameras. And to demonstrate this, I am going to use a camera that has focus. Uh, focus that I can control, so not this phone. Now I have a piece of string here. This piece of string is smaller than the lens of my camera. So it will demonstrate this nicely. So here you can see that this piece of string is in focus and is very, very solid, blocking out the light that is behind it, right? Well, what if I take it out of focus and put myself more in focus instead? Well, now the string kind of looks transparent. It is not blocking out any of my mouth. In fact, you can see the entirety of my mouth moving behind the piece of string. Now, the reason why this was happening is because this piece of string is smaller than the lens of my camera. So the light from my mouth, although some of it was getting blocked by the piece of string, some of it was also hitting the lens of the camera. In the example that Mitchell gave with the coin, it wasn't the zooming in that caused the coin to become visible. It was the change of focus of the camera. 
Although some of the light was being obstructed by the table, the lens was probably so big that the light from the coin still managed to hit parts of the lens. This meant that when the lens was more focused on the coin, the light from the coin was actually being focused into something resolvable. And the part of the table that was obstructing the light was going out of focus, and you could clearly see that in the video. Now that we know about angular resolution and the diffraction limit, let's add some distance. This pole is about three foot off the water, and I'm going to put my camera on top of it. This is a common observation by most people with a zoom camera of seeing a boat disappearing bottom up. But as you can see, it's definitely not going to be due to earth curvature as the horizon is still far in the distance. Whenever I've seen an object disappear bottom up, the horizon has always appeared to be cutting that object off. Now this is a good example of angular size. When you zoom out, it reduces the focal length and the angular size gets so small that it reaches the diffraction limit. When you zoom back in, increasing the focal length, the angular size increases and you can resolve it again. But as you can also see, angular resolution of the image has also changed. Or maybe, just maybe, refraction is making that boat appear to be squashed. Now comparing these two images, on the left, the observer height is one inch, and on the right, the observer height is three foot. And you can see clearly that the boat has started to disappear bottom up. So Mitchell says that there's clearly some hidden, which is laughable because when you put them side by side like this, it's very hard to tell if there is any hidden on this one here. So I decide to overlay it. And when you overlay it, yeah, there's a tiny amount hidden, a very minuscule amount. This tiny amount that's hidden is easily explainable by waves because they are a thing. In fact, it looks more like a wave that's hiding it than anything else. There is also a tiny amount of rotation that I did not account for, but when you do account for scale, there's a minuscule amount that appears hidden. Let's add some more distance. This is Bathurst Lighthouse from 20 kilometers away. The left image is from a 30 meter viewing height and the right image from a two meter viewing height. The obstruction in the right image, the glow proponents will assert is only from earth curvature and nothing else. But I've shown you in this video, the angular resolution can cause obstruction from bottom up without the need of any earth curvature. Well, no, you've made an observation and said, okay, it's because of this thing and then left it at that without doing any further follow-up tests to confirm that it is indeed the thing that you say it is. You also haven't looked at the maths behind the Rayleigh criterion or understood how the Rayleigh criterion actually makes things unresolvable. So whilst that was a nice try by Mitchell to try and explain why things disappear bottom first on a flat earth, it doesn't really explain anything. But anyway, that is it for this video. Leave a like and subscribe if you like this video. Leave a comment letting me know what you'd like me to make videos on in the future. As always, a big shout out to my $20 or more patrons. Huge R's, MC Nutkin, Shaki, Wolfie, Mori, Graymore Ghost, Kid Vicious, and Sarge Campbell. If you want to support me financially, you can do so on Patreon. There should be a link there. But anyway, I will see you in the next video. Between you and me, thank you for watching.